Thank you. And thank you for coming. Uh, I probably don't have to tell you this, but we kind of find ourselves in this very fascinating moment in technology, right? That data and AI are basically getting into the fabric of, of how we live. Data has changed how we shop, how we make friends, how we navigate this world around us. It has made businesses more intelligent and, and more agile, and it has transformed industries. But here is another thing. Uh, oops. There is another set of problems, another set of challenges that we don't often think about it, right? We know about Facebook and Twitter and Alexa and, and, and you know, how to find a way through the dense traffic using Waze. But the thing is that when we look around, there is a class of problems that we're only beginning to scratch the surface. Things like poverty, injustice, lack of access to clean water and, and, and lack of access to medicine, climate, right, emerging diseases. These are the problems of this world that we are only beginning to tackle, and oftentimes they're going to call for new solutions and the new technologies, the kinds of technologies that might not be immediately available around. So a couple of years ago, uh, my colleagues and I kind of started to think about it. You know, we used to kind of volunteer and, and give our skills and you know, help um, in hackathons and, and in data dives and, and think about you know, how you change the world. But then we thought about it and we said, look, uh, we were working in IBM Research. It's one of the largest industrial labs in the world. It has about actually more than 3,000 scientists in over 12 labs around the world. Um, some of the most uh, sought after skills. So we thought about it and we said, well, there got to be a way to tap into this talent and to try to do something else and to try to do good a little bit more formally. So we started a program called Science for Social Good. And the idea is that in here, we kind of team up with NGOs, with uh, uh, public sector agencies, with social enterprises, with the people who are actually really fighting these issues, who are on the forefront of these challenges. And we learn from them. And we listen to their problems. And we listen to what they're facing. And we try to work together and understand, are there new technologies that we can create that can help move the needle? So jointly with them, we scope the projects. And then we invite our scientists to come and to contribute. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples, because I think they're interesting. They tell us something, they educate us, and I think they give us a little bit of food for thought in terms of how should we going about our lives, how should we going about the development of technologies in general, and just kind of thinking about stuff. So here is a first project that we did in this program. We te teamed up with the Cary Institute for Ecosystem Studies in Millwood, New York. Uh, these are the scientists like us, but they don't do technology. They study how disease evolve, how uh, epidemics emerge. And one of the things that we learned from them is that um, most of the epidemics today, and they're increasing global problems, right? We know that we see new diseases that never happened before. We see diseases that we think were in extinguished. Um, and even though we are really, really good about fighting these new outbreaks, we do it reactively, right? We wait for a disease to emerge, for epidemic to happen, and then we go and do something about it. So here we said, okay, what if we can do something proactively? What if we can do something to prevent when the disease will happen and then do and eliminate it before it even occurs? One interesting thing that we learned from, from Care Institute is that uh, most of the modern diseases are what we call zoonotic. Um, Ebola, chikungunya, dengue fever, Zika, they are all viruses that reside in animals. Animal doesn't get sick because they have natural immunity, but then somehow the virus gets transferred to a human and the epidemic emerge. Zika is a very interesting example because in, in, in this case, we actually don't know which animals are the carriers of the, Z, the disease. We just know a couple of them in Africa 
but nothing more than that. No other animals around the world. So in this project, we actually uh, trained machine learning models. We trained artificial intelligence models to learn from the animals that we know are the carriers of these diseases, and then try to predict what are the other animals that could be reservoirs so that we can actually do a targeted animal testing, mosquito control, and other outreach measures to be able to actually prevent the epidemics from happening again. Moving to our next topic, two years ago, uh, we worked with Neighborhood Trust. Neighborhood Trust are um, an NGO, a group of financial advisors that provides financial counseling to low-income individuals. I don't know if you knew that, but about three-quarters of Americans today live from paycheck to paycheck. They're not exactly poor, but they're on the edge. So if something happens, like um, you get into the ER, or your child gets sick, or you get a parking ticket, you're not, afford, you're not able to afford the expense, and then you go down that spiral of predatory lending. So financial counseling for these individuals is really important. The challenge with it that as you probably know all too well, financial counselors are expensive and they're hard to find. So in this project, we actually teamed up with Neighborhood Trust to see if we can develop a cognitive financial advisors, AI-based financial models that in a way can kind of simulate the behaviors and strategies of, of, of real humans and help create automatic financial advice and counseling for people in need, and in a way, actually scale the outreach beyond what's even possible. Moving to the next example, we teamed up with the United Nations Development Program to create NLP-based models, NLP-based tools that could comb through and, and read massive government documents and strategic plans, the kinds of initiatives that they are planning for and the kinds of initiatives that they intend to put together in order to understand how well aligned they are with sustainable development agenda. Are we on a track to deliver what's been promised and are we on a track to actually uh, make this planet a better place? Let's talk about the opioids. Another thing that I didn't know before I, I kind of started to do this is that in the United States, opioid is actually a number one killer. It's the largest health crisis in the modern histories. Opioids today kill more Americans than gun violence and car accidents combined. And what is really kind of strange is that opioid addiction happens in a, in a really benign way, right? You have an injury or you have a pain incident, you go to a doctor, you get a prescription for a little bottle, uh, you take it, sometimes you take it more than it's needed, and then a couple of years down the road, you're an addict. An interesting source of data when it gets to opioid crisis and opioid addiction is the healthcare insurance claims data. It's kind of a weird thing because healthcare insurance claims are designed for a purpose of, of reimbursing a healthcare provider. But if you look at the insurance claim for a particular person, longitudinally, it tells a very interesting story. It tells when you first went to a doctor, what kind of procedure or issue you had, what kind of prescription you got, and how much, and for how long. And then maybe later on, two years down the road, you can see a healthcare claim that tells that a person entered into a rehab, or got a methadone, which is a medicine to, to uh, treat uh, the addiction. So in this project, we're actually starting, it's a long-term work, but we're actually starting how to put together AI models, very fine causal AI models, that can tease out these stories from healthcare claims data. Because if we can do that, if we can understand what types of prescribing behaviors are more or less dangerous, or what kind of individuals are more or less vulnerable, then we can come with better prescribing guidelines, with targeting metrics or, 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 or efforts to help people, and even a better healthcare policy. I don't always kind of have a, I actually don't have a favorite in, 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 in the projects that, that we do, but 
maybe at the moment this is my favorite because it's quite interesting and it's actually um, super mind-boggling. Um, World Health Organization predicts that by 2050, antimicrobial resistance is going to be a leading cause of that on planet. We know that. I mean, the, the, the antibiotics that we take, the antibiotics that are currently produced and sold, are getting less and less effective in treating modern diseases. On the other hand, there are no new drugs, there are no new antibiotics developed because it's not profitable, it's very costly, it takes billions of dollars to create a new drug, and actually it takes more than a decade to develop it and put it on the market. On the other hand, there is this little thing called antimicrobial peptide. It's a peptide sequence that has something like maybe 10 to 50 amino acids. Antimicrobial peptides have the potential to break into the barrier of a cell and actually kill the bacteria. And if kind of designed and developed, they have a potential to become a new hope for developing uh, new antibiotics. Now, what's really interesting when we think in the world of AI, we've seen AI create pictures and paintings and music and deep fakes. But what if we can use and reuse and improve the same generative models that create deep, deep fakes to create new peptides, new drugs, new materials? Isn't that kind of a little bit better use of our time and, and, and innovative energy? Just think about it. So this is a project that we've been running for a while, and it's looking into that possibility. Now, obviously, you see, I can talk about this for hours and hours. I mean, this is something that, when you think about it, opens up our eyes and, and, and gives us this fantastic landscape of possibility. So over the last four or five years, we've, we've conducted over 28 projects from modeling hate speech to understanding how to accelerate scientific discovery to understanding how to design better pathways out of poverty. And whenever we do that, we get asked these questions. People say, hey, you guys, you work for IBM. How do you move that into a product? Or maybe you don't. Maybe, you know, is this just some sort of philanthropy? No, it's not a philanthropy. And it's not quite really about moving it into a product. It's really about the fact that this kind of work and this kind of thinking should be at the very core how we do business. It should be at the very core how we create new solutions and how we develop this technology. And when you think about it, because these kinds of problems are so complex, so difficult to solve, so multifaceted, when we start thinking about them, we become better scientists, better researchers, better developers, and eventually we make our companies and help our companies develop better products. And I don't want to mention, but we also become better human beings. Now, I don't want to wear like very happy pink glasses around all the time, because the reality is that the technology always has two sides, you know? Everything that we've done so far in the, hum in the history of, of, of human race and human progress has this good side and the bad side. And I think as a technologist, as a scientist, as a uh, humanity, we need to also recognize that AI, just as it has the potential to do good, it has the potential to do many, many bad things, right? And there are dangers of AI technology, just like there are dangers of any other technology per se. So we need to also be aware of that because just by doing good and just by talking about good is not going to help us with the adoption of AI. And the benefits of AI are not going to come 
when we only focus on the benefits, we also need to focus on the other side as well. And this notion of responsible AI and trustworthy AI is getting more and more important. And this is something that uh, we actually read quite a bit in, in, in the news today. Um, we know about this issue, and there is this kind of outcry for trustworthy and responsible AI. But what does it really mean? Well, it means that AI is a technology that, in addition to all these opportunities to do good, it's also touching on some very important aspects of our lives, very sensitive aspects of our lives. Credit, education, criminal justice system, employment. Even in our companies, AI or AI components are within the most critical workflows for our businesses. So this notion of trusting the technology, of trusting the algorithm, is getting into the forefront. But what does it really mean to trust an algorithm? That's an interesting question. For a long time, when AI was still in the lab, and when we developed new and more powerful algorithms, we created this notion of trust with accuracy. We would like to say, hey, you know what? My algorithm is 99% accurate. Yes, and that's great. But that's the, not the only thing that matters. There are many other things that are important to earn a trust in technology. So for example, when we look at the algorithmic decision, we need to know that this decision doesn't have a potential to harm an individual or a community. We need to make sure that this decision we understand and then we can relate to because we don't quite accept things that are not close to us. We also need to uh, make sure that the system itself, the system that created this decision, is safe from tampering and that this decision was not manipulated by. So the question is then, how do you take these things that are so uniquely human, things that are essentially characteristics of human beings, and how do you then wire them into a piece of technologies? So let me show you a couple of examples. Last year, uh, we started to focus on this issue of fairness in AI, right? Artificial intelligence algorithms are created and trained from data. The data that we generate, and we, as we all know, are not the most perfect of individuals. The data that we create reflects our past decisions, our conscious and unconscious biases, even our errors in judgments, whether we wanted that or not. So when we use that data and train an algorithm, the algorithm picks up these patterns and then automates them and begins to scale them more broadly. So to deal with that issue of bias in machine learning, last year, as a part of this program, we created a toolbox called AI Fairness 360. Today, it's the most comprehensive library of algorithms that can be used to handle, to detect, and handle biases in machine learning. There are probably over 70 different types of metrics and checkers that can help developers detect that the model is biased. There are dozens of algorithms that actually allow them to mitigate or reduce the bias in this decision making. Most importantly, there are many, many industry tutorials because the only way we can help deal with this issue is when we educate the practitioners. Most importantly, even though we are IBM, this is a piece of technology that we made an open source because there are kinds of problems in technology that we can deal with and solve only when we work on it together, only when we work on it as a community of scientists. So putting something in the open source and working on it collaboratively, making it better, moving the needle, is the only way we will deal with such a complex issue. Now, if you think that 
biases in AI are difficult, let's talk about explainability. When people explain things, like we do it in this amazing way that um, it's such a fantastic toolkit of explanations that we have. We wave our hands, we give examples, um, we show counterexamples. Well, wouldn't it be really fantastic if we could teach artificial intelligence to do the same? But it's not easy, because one type of explanation doesn't fit all. It doesn't fit every user or every application domain. Here are a couple of examples. If you're a doctor and you're diagnosing a patient, you may benefit from seeing patients who are similar to the case that you're diagnosing, because this is how doctors work. If you're a consumer who just applied for a loan and your loan was denied, what you really want to know is, why was my loan denied? and what I can do to reverse the outcome. On the other hand, if you are a legislator or regulator probing into that, si that same system, that, that, that credit approval system, you don't want to know about one decision or one data point. You really need to understand the behavior of a system as a whole in, all, in order to understand whether it really violated the regulation or whether it violated the law. So how do you then do that? Just last month, uh, we, re we created and released another toolkit. It's called AI Explainability 360. And it's a toolbox of algorithms that do actually exactly what I just described. They give a developer or a data scientist a toolbox of explanations, a variety of techniques that can equip AI to be more transparent and more explainable. They generate examples. They generate counterexamples. They summarize the behavior of a system in a set of rules and describe it as a whole. And again, it's an open source because it is a big thing, it is a big problem, and we are all going to be better off only when we work on this together. Moving to my next example, making AI safe and robust. Because of the very nature of, of AI algorithms, right, the way they're developed and the way they're trained from data, the data that we don't typically collect ourselves or maybe even own ourselves, there are many, many vulnerabilities that are very typical to AI, unlike the other uh, types of software systems. For example, adversarial um, attackers can inject training data with samples, we call them the poison samples, and if the system learns from that or is trained from the poison data set, it can be fooled in doing some really bad things. They can probe into a system, and oftentimes, by just looking at the decisions that the system makes, they can steal the algorithm inside, or they can even steal the training data. So how do you, do, how do you deal with that? Um, just like fairness, just like an explainability, there is no one solution that fits all. So also last year, we've compiled, compiled a toolbox called Adversarial Robustness 360. It's a toolbox, the most comprehensive toolbox of attacks and defenses on AI. Because the more you attack it, the more aggressive you are, the better off you are in understanding how to defend. And again, Adversarial Robustness 360 grows every day with every new contribution. And it's open for all the scientists, all the researchers, all the developers to contribute that stuff and grow their community. So just to conclude, if we think about it, doing good, building trustworthy components, creating responsible solutions, and developing responsibly this technology is really critical. It's the only way we should be actually doing it. Because it's the only way for us, as a society, as a humanity, to be able to create and put together 
new solutions, better solutions, much needed solutions, the kinds of solutions that truly represent ourselves and the future of technology. Thank you.